If you haven't already done so, click on subscribe now and turn on notifications to get alerts when the next episode of The Black Ship is out. Now, on with the story. In a dark, ironic fashion, time that felt as if it never advanced before the assault on the Drazen forces was now constraining his throat, holding his neck in a powerful, restraining chokehold as minutes ebbed like seconds. Only twenty minutes had passed since the attack, and subsequent retreat with Drazen fighters and frigates steadily chasing him and his fellow pilots. However, in his mind that time lapse had been barely registered. The frigates were slower than the large contingent of fighters, but they showed no signs of giving up any time soon. If the fighters caught up to them and forced them into a dogfight, the frigates would catch up only to deal the finishing blow to any unlucky survivor. The problem was clear in his mind. If they fought, they would be turned to shreds to the last fighter. Fleeing was the only solution, but a doomed one. Drazan fighters were, as always, less maneuverable than their principality counterparts, but they were faster. But the fighters following them were different. Not in their design, but in their speed. They were much quicker than any he'd ever seen in the training chambers, and even the ones he encountered in gin tracks. Wyatt narrowed his eyes and let out a disgruntled growl as the reality slapped him across the face. Even if they used the afterburners to their breaking point, they wouldn't make it anywhere near the preset coordinates to meet up with the Nornavio. Worst of all, thanks to their jammers, their long-range sensors were useless, so he didn't know if more Drazen were coming behind the frigates. We can't fight them head-on and we can't flee. Everyone is keeping quiet, but they must realize we're doomed if we don't do something. To make matters worse, we can't even scatter. They outnumber us five to one and can give chase to every single one of us easily. Come on, Wyatt, think, think. There has to be something I can do, Wyatt shouted in his mind as he gritted his teeth angrily. But what can I do? We lack the firepower to inflict any true damage, huh? Going down fighting seems like it's our only option, and those monsters know it. They're not even bothering to make use of their remaining missiles anymore. Eyes narrowed in defiance as the tactical display showcased how the Drazon pursuers were getting closer by the second. I reject that option he spat with venom. If it were only him, he'd gladly put his life on the line, even die if that meant taking even just one last Drazan with him. But he wasn't alone. Redford had put 79 lives under his command, and most importantly, he'd promised Cynthia and Clara he'd come back. There has to be another route. There has to be, Wyatt muttered again. Telling himself that for the twentieth time, he focused on thinking again, reviewing his options yet again, reliving his now numerous training sessions with his squad mates and his experience as a pilot. After another minute of thinking, he chuckled to himself. If only I had a few minds, I could try to lay a trap, but all I have are missiles. His muttering slowed down as he recalled the first real battle he had partaken in. Namely speaking, the trap set against the black ship cruiser. It wasn't the same, not by a long shot, but the spark of an idea formed in his mind and soon burrowed its roots deep, refusing to let go. It was a simple idea. What if he could replicate the rap on a much smaller scale? Opening a link to every fighter, he spoke. This is Composter 1. Everyone release a single active missile at my command, ready for remote detonation. As you command, Composter 1 replied Alpha-1, trying to hide the fear clogging his throat. Understood, Beta-1 complied. Omega-1, what are your intentions? asked Gamma-1 somewhat nervously. We will comply, but we will need the missiles for the coming battle. He's right, Wyatt, Raquel interjected on their squadron channel. When those bastards catch up to us, we'll need them if we hope to have any chance at all. Does it matter? Nultar argued somberly. We'll be able to take down a few of them if that before they tear us apart in a straight-up fight. I'd rather go with whatever our squadron leader is thinking. I intend to find out if we can survive or not, Wyatt replied to both channels, silencing them. We have nothing to lose as we stand. Gamma Wedge is ready, Lieutenant, replied Gamma One a few seconds later alongside his fellow Wedge leaders. Wait for my command, said the heterochromatic pilot as he focused on the tactical display. After a minute of silence, he spoke up. Release he said in a hushed tone, almost fearing the Drazen would hear him through the vacuum of space. 
At once, 80 smaller dots appeared on the screen directly on the path they had just passed through. They would be invisible to the Drazen as the missiles were not burning toward any objective. The wait felt both eternal and passed in the blink of an eye as the Drazen reached the impromptu minefield. Now! Wyatt shouted as he pressed the button that detonated his missile almost instantly. Simultaneously, the 80 missiles exploded amid the Drazen fighters. Computer, how many enemy fighters are pursuing us? He asked as he only saw a couple of red dots vanish from his display. 396 enemy fighters registered, eight fewer than the previously registered record, the AI replied. We are so dead, Leopold called out, his voice a mix of dread and nervous laughter. That only took down eight of them. Thank you for stating the obvious, Dakar, Gregor added, also failing to mask the dread coating his words. Wyatt paid them little attention as he focused on something else. While he'd hoped for a more devastating result, the destruction of the Drazon outright wasn't his goal. He wasn't naive enough to believe mere missiles could compare with the destructive force a tactical mind could achieve. Whilst deadly and effective on unshielded targets, missiles were there more to overwhelm the PD capabilities of bigger ships, deplete shields, or deal a finishing blow on defenseless fighters, bombers, and gunships. It was the second purpose that he focused on this time. Much to his relief, while these fighters were faster, their shields remained the same. If anything, they were slightly weaker than standard. A wicked smile spread across his lips as ideas crossed his mind. Check their shields readings was his only command while his attention was almost entirely focused on his machinations. Thanks to the jammers, their sensors were severely hampered, but at close ranges, even if they weren't entirely correct, their sensor readings revealed a particular truth. Only eight fighters had been destroyed, but almost a hundred fighters had suffered significant damage to their shields even if they were now slowly recovering them. By the prince, we should do it again. With their shields so heavily damaged, we're bound to take down at least a fifth of them, Leopold proposed. That won't work. Look at their movements. Their formation spread out a little more to avoid another incident. That trick won't work again, Noltar countered. Perhaps we should have used all three missiles, Raquel asked, uncertain. And waste our missiles so recklessly? Gregor replied, humming deeply. Sir, what are we to do now? Smiling, Wyatt replied, I have an idea, but it will be risky. Noltar is correct. The Drazen will be ready if we try that again. That's why we're going to do it using our remaining missiles. He paused for a moment. But Wyatt, you said it yourself. They'll be expecting that trap again, Noltar pointed out. True but only if we remain as we are. The Drazen believe themselves to be inherently superior to any other life form. They may be intelligent, but their arrogance is one of their greatest weaknesses. That's why we're going to turn off our engine thrusters, Wyatt explained. We're going to what? Lieutenant, they are faster than us as it is. If we stop gaining speed, they'll close the distance quicker, Raquel protested. She's right, Wyatt. We're going to fucking die if we do that, Leopold protested. I would have liked to at least bet a beautiful woman before I got my ass killed. Can you please stop thinking about your damned carnal desires as we're about to face certain doom? Gregor protested. Not exactly how I pictured my end would be, Noltar added, unafraid. Eyes narrowing, Wyatt could understand their positions. Were the roles reversed, he too would be protesting or silently voicing his displeasure at the mention of a plan that sounded like certain death. Is this what command is really about? What Galt and Redford were trying to point out? To make decisions? To own them? And have others follow them? I'm not sure if I like this responsibility, but everyone depends on me as their commanding officer to achieve victory over our enemies and to return alive, Wyatt thought, and sighed tiredly. As many as I can manage. Sir? Gregor asked, concerned, as the dispute among his squadron came to a halt. Do you trust me? Wyatt asked, then cleared his throat. Ignore that question. Are you willing to trust me? All of you? You're our squadron leader and commanding officer, Wyatt. We have to... Leopold began but was cut off by Wyatt. Forget about that. Forget about rules and the chain of command. Will you trust me, not merely as your commanding officer, but as a fellow pilot putting his life on the line like the rest of you? Wyatt asked, and a silence fell between them for several seconds until a chuckling Noltar cut through the silence. For what is worth, Lieutenant, 
I'll follow your lead, not because I have nothing to lose, but because you've proven you're different compared to the usual stock. Give the order, sir, Noltar proclaimed firmly. Heh, <laughs> I guess if I'm to die today, I'd rather die alongside a fellow commoner rather than serve as the shield for some petulant blue blood. Ah, what the hell. Count me in, sir, Leopold joined in with a raspy chuckle. You are a strange one, you know, Raquel said with a laugh. You defy everything I've considered normal until now, Lieutenant. Why should this be any different? I'll follow you, sir. While I don't share the same level of enthusiasm as the rest of our comrades, sir, I entrust my life unto your command, as it should be expected and as a personal gesture of trust. Guide us, sir, Gregor said lastly. Then this is what we will do, Wyatt said, his heart beating a little louder and faster in his chest after receiving their answers. First, we'll kill our engines. Then, we'll launch our remaining missiles in an unguided forward trajectory. After two minutes, we'll turn the missiles around and have them burn at full capacity to decelerate them until we move faster than them. Then, we'll remotely deactivate their thrusters, creating another minefield. While the missiles fly, we'll break our formations and begin to spread out in a grid. Everyone with me so far? Sir, if we break formation, that'll give the impression we're preparing to scatter, Gregor pointed out. Gregor is right. The Drazen have enough numbers to track us easily once we scatter, Leopold added. But we're not going to scatter, Wyatt said, and pregnant silence followed. We'll maintain that new grid formation to cover more space. That way, we won't be hitting ourselves. His smile widened until his teeth were on display. Once we're about to pass through the missiles, we'll deploy our flares in full. We'll be creating a sensor-baffling cloud the Drazen will have to pass through to get through us. Holy shit, Noltar muttered. You want to blind them to the missiles as we pass them? What if they just veer off and avoid it altogether? Raquel asked. They won't. The Drazen are stubborn bastards. They like to be as direct as possible in everything they do. Our leader is right about them. They're arrogant to a fault, Leopold added. The Drazen will be expecting a repeat of our previous tactic. I am more than happy to oblige, but in a different way. Once they pass through the baffling cloud, they'll reach the missiles after a few seconds. They won't detect them in time. We'll detonate them then. As he talked, Wyatt felt the pleasant fire in his stomach spread across his body. It felt nice and filled him with delight. I doubt that'll destroy many of them, Raquel protested initially. But I already said I'd follow you, sir, so I will. I'm not about to break my word. Good, Wyatt replied, satisfied. Because the missiles aren't there to destroy their fighters. A collective, huh? Rumbled in his ears, making his already wide grin turn devilishly devious. Convincing the wedge leaders wasn't as easy, but after hearing the entirety of his plan, they agreed reluctantly to follow his orders, arguing that if it failed and they somehow survived, they would do everything in their power to report him and protest against his leadership position to Commander Redford. Wyatt agreed knowing that if his plan failed, then they would be likely dead anyway. After a short discussion, he agreed to make a minor modification to his original plan. Taking advice from Beta-1 instead of killing their engines outright, they would instead lower them to minimal thrust, giving the impression that they were low on fuel, rather. The Drazan were unlikely to miss the chance to kill and capture them if they could. Second, as much as Wyatt wanted to tell the rest of the pilots about the plan, everyone, even Leopold, advised against it. There would be panic and several disgruntled voices among them. The probability of breaking apart for the sake of survival was already escalating by the minute. The last thing they needed was for their limited forces to be diminished even further and cause a complete rupture of command. Instead, they would obey their given orders under the pressure of his authority given directly by Commander Redford and, by extension, that of the princess. The commoner pilots in their midst would obey regardless. It was the more self-serving nobles who were the root of such a predicament. Regardless of everything, with a goal set for everyone to reach, they began to move. The first step was taken, and the Drazan reacted almost instantly. Their formation tightened once more, and some of them launched a few missiles their way, detonating them halfway through as a precaution against encountering another undetected makeshift minefield. Then, as planned, they all launched their remaining missiles forward, unguided well beneath full propulsion. 
They would go slightly faster than the fighters themselves, enough to cover a few thousand kilometers before their thrusters would be disabled. Again, the Drazen reacted by spreading out, but when it was clear the missiles were not changing direction, their formations tightened again. Wyatt could only imagine their confusion, making him chuckle. At the two-minute mark, the missiles deactivated their thrusters for a second, turned around completely, and their thrusters reignited at full force, rapidly slowing them down. Once the desired speed was reached, the missile's thrusters were completely disabled, leaving their payload active but now silent, freely floating in space. Break formation! Begin to spread and form a grid! he commanded, and slowly every wedge broke into their separate squadrons, and then the squadrons broke apart into individual fighters. Slowly but surely in his tactical display, they all formed a semi-circular grid barely larger than their previous tighter formation. It didn't need to be any bigger than that. All it had to do was to give each fighter ample space to make a quick maneuver without putting anyone else at risk, and most importantly, give the impression that they were getting ready to scatter. Again, the Drazen fighters spread their formations, each of them ready to pursue their claimed targets at a moment's notice. The message was loud and clear. None of them would escape their retribution. As they approached the missiles, Wyatt feared his plan would fail and he'd get everyone under his command killed. It was a nauseating sensation, but one that brought him an odd sense of focus aside from the thrill of battle. Watching the 80 small green dots that made up his wing on the tactical display, Wyatt focused on them for what felt like an eternity, imagining their faces, their fear, their insecurity, and dread. He made his decision right there and then, against his better judgment, and hesitant at first, he opened a channel with every pilot. He opened his mouth, not sure what he was going to say, so he allowed his mouth to move on its own. This is... Wyatt Staples, before we continue, I wanted to tell all of you. I can't promise that all of us will come back alive. I can't promise that some of us will survive this, even if everything goes right. Likely, we're all about to die. All I can promise you is that I am doing everything in my power to ensure our survival and destroy those forsaken carrion feeders in the process. Fight on, sons and daughters of the Principality. Do your duty. Fight for the Prince, for the Principality. And if we are to die today, then let us burn as many Drazen as we can so that your families and countless innocents may live another day in peace. He took in a deep breath. Loyalty is its own reward. Loyalty is its own reward, came a nearly unanimous chant after only a second of silence. He cut the channel a moment later, satisfied and with trembling hands that gripped his controllers tightly. He expected any of his squadmates to reply to his impromptu speech, but they either had nothing to say or chose to keep their thoughts to themselves. Either way, he couldn't spare more than a fleeting moment on such thoughts as the next part of the plan was about to happen. This was it. The decisive moment. Everything that followed would be decided in the coming seconds. Just as they were about to reach the missiles, Wyatt gave the command. Release flares! In but a second, every pilot deployed their flares, creating a sensor-baffling wall right in front of the Drazan fighters. Everyone held their breath for a second, but the Drazan, as hoped, pushed forth. They launched their remaining missiles as a volley, however, and they detonated amidst the baffling cloud, hoping to strike any potential trap there, but that was their mistake. The missiles, still moving through space, were well beyond the blast radius of their Drazan counterparts. Wyatt's wing passed through their missile field without problem, and just a few seconds later, the Drazen pursuers pushed through the remnants of the baffling cloud, unable to detect the trap set before them in time. Once the Drazen reached the second impromptu minefield, Wyatt gave the command, Now! Like before, he pressed a button and his two Hawk missiles exploded. 158 other explosions matched his own, their combined payload wreaking havoc amidst the Drazen fighters. On his display, only two red dots vanished. However, Wyatt wasn't paying attention to the potential destructive power of the missiles. He was only interested in the sensor readings of their shields. His eyes shone with pure, vicious, vindictive, murderous intent in an instant. Kill your engines! Turn now! came the command as he himself performed it. He felt the rapid and sudden turn, but compared to his stunt at Jintrax, this was nothing. 
It took only a split second to see his entire wing now facing their drazen pursuers, their grid forming a cone with their twin-linked coil guns pointed straight at the corpse eaters. Open fire, Wyatt shouted, half laughing, half shouting. He didn't feel his fighter rattle as the coil guns fired a deadly barrage of magnetically accelerated metal. One barrage was joined by another and another until the sheer volume turned into a hail of fury and death directed at the Drazen fighters who were so eagerly pursuing them. Disoriented by the trap, but confident thanks to their numbers, they never saw their prey had turned around and had fired upon them until it was too late. With most of them suffering from depleted shields or severely drained, the concentrated hail of metal hit them in full. Through another screen, Wyatt watched with fascination as dozens of Drazen fighters were turned into scrap in the blink of an eye. Many of them exploded, some of them sending their debris colliding with another ship, damaging it or outright destroying it. It was a chain reaction of pure destruction and chaos that lasted no more than a few seconds, but that was more than enough. The Drazen broke their formations to avoid further damage, but they were now wounded, confused, and surprised. Wyatt's heart beat loudly, like a drum struck by a raging beast, as the 400 Drazen fighters were reduced to 127, with half of them damaged to some capacity. Engage! Engage! Take to your formations! They still outnumber us! Protect each other and bring them down one by one! Focus on surviving, not killing as many as you can! We'll reduce them to scraps one fighter at a time before their frigates arrive! Composters with me! Wyatt ordered as he was already moving to intercept a group of Drazen. Some Drazen were quicker to regain their senses than others, managing to form up, ready to engage their enemies. Half a minute later, the two sides clashed. Coil gunfire, quick laser bursts, and quick swift maneuvers were the order of the day. From an outside perspective, it was pure chaos. But the dancers were professionals, and there was an organization to their movements that only they could fully understand. The numerically superior Drazen, once so sure of their victory, found themselves culled to nearly a fourth of their original strength and set against a more organized, fully shielded, and invigorated force of feed who had dared assault their precious home. Driven by righteous rage, the Drazen fought back with everything they had. Wyatt clenched his jaw tightly as he spun twice, finishing with a sharp turn to the left and firing a quick burst that killed a Drazan as the fighter exploded. Almost immediately, he used a short burst of his afterburner to position himself at the perfect angle right beneath a trio of Drazan fighters who were pursuing a lone fighter. Firing a controlled burst, most shots landed on the leading Drazan. Its weakened shields flared, then gave out, and the rest punctured it completely, eviscerating the pilot instantly. Unfortunately, the other two fighters were not dissuaded by the death of their comrade and instead opened fire on their prey. Shields flickered, died, and a cry of terror was silenced when the fighter exploded. In revenge, Wyatt fired again, taking out another fighter on short notice, and before he could kill the third, the AI informed him that his shields were now at 82%. As he made a quick evasive maneuver, he saw Leopold coming behind him, quickly destroying the offender who had shot him. There was no time for words of gratitude as a group of five Drazan pounced upon a trio of fighters currently chasing two Drazan. Nultar, he ordered, barely having time to send the coordinates. He would have gone himself, but his squad mate was closer. Besides, he had spotted Raquel and Gregor dealing with a group of seven Drazen. On it, Noltar called back, quickly moving to provide aid. To his fortune, two additional fighters from Omega Wedge joined him. With that aside, Wyatt moved to support his squad mates while Leopold engaged another Drazen in time to save another pilot. Moving quickly, he fired upon the Drazen at the back of the group. Its shields were nearly full, and his shots did nothing more than flicker them. Taking notice of him, three of the seven Drazen disengaged and moved to intercept Wyatt. Wyatt's shield flickered again, but this time he took it intentionally as he took a sharp turn, fully outmaneuvering the Drazen trio even if darkness crawled at the edges of his vision from the momentary strain. It didn't matter. He had them where he wanted. Unleashing a full barrage of coil gun fire, two of the Drazen were turned into debris, whilst the third accelerated in an attempt to disengage him. The black-haired man allowed it, turning his attention back to Raquel and Gregor. 
They had dealt with three of their four remaining enemies, but in the heat of battle, another quartet of Drazen moved in to engage after tearing to shreds at least two other fighters. The quartet noticed his approach and, eager for an easier kill, turned to face him instead. With the aid of some well-placed shots and quick dodges, he depleted the shield of two of them just in time for Gregor and Raquel to move in behind them, ready to deliver the killing blow. Understandably, he was beyond puzzled when his squadmates instead fired at the other two Drazan. That momentary lapse in focus was paid in full when his shields were lowered to a 20% strength. Engulfed by the deadly rhythm of battle once more, he was quick to dispatch his original first two aggressors with a hail of fury before quickly evading a barrage of fire coming from the two remaining survivors. They were heavily damaged, but still living, showcased by a futile attempt at ramming him head on. The distance was too great for them to do anything, and a quick burst from his coil guns silenced them forever. Analyzing the tactical display, he saw no more than fifty red dots moving away in a desperate attempt to disengage from the battle. There were nearly thirty stragglers left on the battlefield who were being destroyed one by one. The battle was over. It had lasted no more than a few minutes at most, but it was over. Releasing a breath he didn't know was being held back, Wyatt inspected the situation in more detail. It didn't take long to notice that the Drazan stragglers were being eliminated by squadron leaders. More prominently among them, Gamma One. That's when he noticed that the other Drazan he thought Raquel and Gregor had eliminated were not dead, just crippled. Easy pickings and nothing more than target practice as they stumbled through space aimlessly. Raquel, Gregor, what are you doing? He asked as the satisfaction of having killed so many of his hated foes was dwarfed by a new type of rage. Why did you not kill them? For that matter, what the hell were you thinking? You could have taken down two of those things, but you went for the others instead. I nearly lost my shields. Sir, I apologize, but those were your kills. We had no right to take them, Gregor answered, confused. Gregor is right, sir. They and the other stragglers are yours for the taking, as it should be. As it is your right, Raquel added, sharing in Gregor's confusion. My right, Wyatt muttered in utter astonishment. What are you? His words died in his throat when he saw a group of three fighters giving chase to the retreating. Opening a channel with them, he spoke in a heavy, demanding tone, his rage revived. What do you think you're doing? Lambda 5, Sirius 2, Zeta 2, return to your formations immediately. But sir, Lieutenant, we can still take down a few of them. Our ammunition storages are at 30% capacity, Sirius 1 replied. I'm terribly sorry, Lieutenant Staples. I tried to stop them, but they heeded not my orders, Sirius One commanded. Disengage immediately. The battle is over. We have our chance to flee. I repeat, I order you to break chase and return to your respective squadrons and formations, Wyatt ordered, putting more weight into his orders. We're not cowards, sir. We can show our worth at last, replied Zeta Two. You idiots, Wyatt cried out in fury. Once they notice you're isolated, they'll pounce on you. Turn back now! Sirius Two sighed tiredly. It seems that a commoner will forever be a commoner. You know nothing of honor, Wyatt. Shit, half of them. Wyatt watched with futility as those three green dots were all but vanquished in a matter of seconds. The Drazen saw their chance and took it. For a moment, the force that annihilated the three idiots seemed to contemplate something, but whatever it was, they deemed it was unworthy of the risk and turned back, joining their accursed brethren. Anyone else wants to join them? And why are those four still not destroyed? Kill them, Wyatt protested, clenching his fists tightly. They're your rightful kills, sir, Gregor repeated. He's right, you know, Nultar joined in the conversation. You'll get more accolades that way. Faster, too. It's how things are, Wyatt. Oh, shit. Don't tell me, Leopold began. Guys, he doesn't know about glory kill rights. We can discuss this on the way back. We've lost too much time already, and lives. Scanning through the tactical display and his monitors, Wyatt quickly detected seven fighters drifting away aimlessly. They were either dead or completely disabled. He hoped the second option was the right answer. Taking them into account, he also was quick to add up the total loss of five fighters and their pilots. Another 15 fighters reported heavy damage, but they could still move. The rest presented either light damage to no damage at all. Raquel, Gregor, 
Destroy those fighters, now, he ordered coldly. Rather than argue again, they obeyed. A quick burst from their coil guns was enough to turn the crippled vessels into mere debris. Computer, save the trajectory of the seven drifting friendlies. Trajectory saved, the AI replied. If they are alive, they won't activate their rescue beacons yet with the Drazan so close by. They have around 12 hours of emergency life support. That should give us enough time to meet with the Nor Navio and launch a quick retrieval if they are alive, Wyatt thought with mild displeasure. A raptor fighter's cockpit wasn't made to fit two people in it. But during an emergency, it could house another person, although it would be tight and incredibly uncomfortable. Wyatt narrowed his eyes. The Drazen fighters were approaching the limits of his sensors, and he wondered how far behind the frigates were. They needed to leave now, but the idea of leaving potential survivors left a sour taste in his mouth, and he disliked it. Send trajectories to everyone. Sent, the computer replied, to those undamaged and nearest to the marked points, quickly perform an emergency retrieval. Leave the fighter and rescue the pilot if they still live. I know it will be uncomfortable, but I will not leave them here floating for hours when Drazan will likely search for survivors soon, said Wyatt. The situation, urgent as it was, could endure a few minutes if only a single life could be saved. This is Procyon 2. Pilot is dead. Sirius 5 reporting, pilot secured. Beta-4 here, pilot retrieved. Epsilon-3 reporting there is no survivor. Survivor retrieved, new one out. This is Theta-5, there is no pilot present. The cockpit was completely torn asunder. I'm sorry, Composter-1. Critical condition for this pilot. She won't make it unless we leave now, sir, Iota-3 announced. That's everyone, Wyatt proclaimed. Return to your formations and let's move out. We can't afford to give those carrion feeders more time to prepare a counter-assault. Taking heed of his orders, the surviving 68 fighters returned to their original destination, eager to rendezvous with the Noir Navio. He could hardly believe that so many of them survived, or that they survived at all. Now, hundreds more of Drazan were dead, even if it meant the loss of 12 pilots. He would not mourn for the three idiots who got themselves killed. They acted on their own damn thirst for glory, and it got them killed, much like it had cost the life of Abacus Reed. He only hoped the three idiots didn't have older brothers demanding his head be presented as a suitable recompense, but their demise reminded him of a more pressing issue. Leopold, what are these glory kill rites? Allow me to explain, Noltar interjected. It is as it sounds, honestly. The leader of every group, be them a small team of Marines, ROSF strike teams, or army squadrons, platoons, cohorts, or whatever else is, well, entitled to receive the glory of a kill whenever possible. What? Wyatt uttered lowly, unwilling to believe what he was hearing. It is more difficult for fighter squadrons to do so, but the same principle is withheld, sir. Squadron members are expected to serve, protect, and aid their leader whenever possible during combat, up to sacrificing themselves for the sake of their leader. It is not a written rule, of course, but it is highly expected to follow the spirit of it. This includes, of course, facilitating the accumulation and claiming of glory, accolades, and prestige through glory kills. It is an honor for us to present you with a target for you to claim as... Shut up, Wyatt suddenly said, cutting Gregor off. This... This never happened during our practice simulations. Why? Is it because they were training routines and not simulated combat trials? Yes, Raquel answered. How, how could you not have known? Personal glory and honor are important, sir. The higher you stand, the brighter the accolades, the greater the rewards you will receive. She paused for a brief moment. Her next words came softer, weaker, defeated. Yours is more important. That's how things are. Wyatt's eyes widened, and he felt something snap within him. I don't care about honor or glory. What are they good for if you're dead? He shouted angrily before punching the ceiling of his cockpit out of pure frustration. You talk about this, this disgusting, pointless, stupid practice as if it was as vital as breathing. What good is it for? You talk about honor and glory and prestige all the fucking time, and yet you happily disobey orders just to satiate your hunger to get a taste of it? What does honor taste like? What does glory look like? Sir, I think... Gregor tried to interject, but Wyatt continued regardless. The floodgates had been opened, and he was not ready to stop. I'll tell you, Undaj, 
Glory looks like a destroyed fighter. Honor tastes like ash. I can only imagine how many pilots... No, how many people have died over something so immensely stupid. I got close to joining them because you two, Raquel Otilo and Gregor Undaj, wanted to help elevate my glory instead of killing fucking Drazan. Do you want to honor me so badly? Take the fucking shot next time. I don't care who gets the credit as long as the mission is complete and we come back home alive, he breathed out angrily, panting heavily for several seconds before delivering his closing words. If you want to gain glory, go ahead, do it. I won't try to stop anyone else ever again. Go ahead and join Abacus Reed and countless others. Me. I would rather live to fight another day if I can help it, even if it means carrying some meaningless mark of shame upon my shoulders. Keep your precious honor. Drink your rancid glory. You can take them. Victory shall suffice for me. For an eternally long minute, no one dared speak nor breathe too loudly. His anger abated. Wyatt finished in his typical dry but cordial tone. We survived. We managed to beat the Drazen hunting us. And more importantly, we return with 72 lives. He let out a tired sigh. That's my victory. Our dead enemies are worthless compared to that.